So thank you, Christina, for the kind introduction. Um, while people are still coming in, let me start by telling a bit about the history of my research that I'm going to present. Um, I've been working with uh, two PhD students, Jack and Jorge, and a postdoc, Rolando. And when Rolando joined my team some five years ago, he introduced me to distance bounding protocols. Uh, having a background in uh, authentication protocols, I, I looked at the distance bounding protocols world, and it turned out that they had a very uh, attack-oriented view on distance bounding protocols. Uh, there are various types of attack, and the sports is to protect against these attacks. Well, I'm used to having a security property that could be verified. So th that uh, set my uh, mind of uh, thinking what, what is going on in this field and how can we uh, bring it to a more a symbolic model, a more symbolic approach, which is independent of particular attacks. And we formulated uh, our work uh, some four years ago as uh, conjecture, submitted a proposal, hired PC students on that, and Jorge picked up the task of uh, doing that work, and Zach, uh, my other co-author, uh, implemented everything in a current model checker, uh, Tamarin. So first, a very short overview of my presentation. I will uh, have two parts. The first part, I will recap some knowledge that is needed, existing knowledge that is needed to interpret our new results. And then I will come to uh, our results, which is in fact a simplification of current uh, analysis models of uh, distance bounding protocols. And the simplification uh, boils down to uh, doing away with time, doing away with location, and only look at the order of the events in uh, the execution traces of the protocol. So let's first look at uh, the problem of, uh, that, that we are trying to uh, solve. So the problem is that once we uh, introduce electronic means to, for example, open your car, you will be susceptible to protocols, to protocol attacks that are different from the standard authentication attacks. And if you look at this example, you see a modern car with uh, some guy who has uh, car keys. And let's assume that these keys are passive keys in the sense that they can communicate automatically with the car and open the car door and start the car engine. And the idea is that the car door will only be opened automatically if he is near the car and the car engine will only be started if he is within the car. And now the idea of the attack that's called the re relay attack is that you simply take the messages from the car to the keys and relay them at any distance that you see fit, and you relay the answers back to the car. And in that way, if, the, if the, this owner of the car is in the shop doing his, shops, uh, doing his uh, shopping, then the car can be stolen easily by people who collude to relay these messages. So that's the, the basic idea. And uh, the typical attack here is called the relay attack, which is a man in the middle attack, where the attacker simply forwards every communication to the other party and the, in that way wins some distance. These kind of attacks have been proven in practice, uh, not only on cars, also on uh, your smart card uh, payments, uh, where you, Murdoch and Dreimer in 2007 proved that you can uh, fool somebody into thinking that he's buying a package of cigarettes, while in fact he is buying a diamond and somebody else has taken the diamond away. So that's also a kind of relay attack and also a Google wallet attack that was uh, reported uh, in 2013. And the solution to this Relay problem is the development of distance bounding protocol. So a distance bounding protocol is an authentication protocol that has an added feature. And the feature is that it measures the distance between the two parties executing this protocol. So there will be a reader, which is offering a service to a client and the client has a tag. And only if the tag is close enough to the reader, the service will be offered, the door will be opened, for example. Uh, let's have a look at a very simple uh, diagram to explain that. The reader has this, uh, this uh, distance D that he requires, uh, the, the, he requires the, the, the tag to be within this perimeter in order to offer the service. And then in a communication with the tag, in the case that the tag is within the perimeter, the tag, the, the protocol will succeed 
after execution in a positive way, well, if the tag is outside the parameter, the protocol will fail and will deny the service to the tag. Even if the tag is willing to do something bad, if the tag itself is the adversary, then this protocol should fail with the tag outside the parameter. And another scenario is this man in the middle attack where we have an adversary who is not a normal user, but he can somehow reach a user outside the parameter and try to somehow use the information from the tag to prove that he is inside, or in fact, that the tag is inside the parameter. That's also an attack that we want to uh, prevent to happen. If we zoom in on to what a protocol would do, we see that a, a distance bounding protocol uh, executes in three phases. The first phase is to establish some common ground on uh, the, 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 say, the randomness that they share. The second phase is the fast phase, and sometimes there is a third phase, which is exchange of signatures to prove really that somebody has followed the protocol. So the fast phase is the interesting part of the protocol where we see that uh, there's a reader who starts by uh, making up a challenge, which is probably a fresh random challenge, and this challenge will be sent to the tag in order for the tag to calculate the correct response to this particular challenge. And the calculation of that response will take some time, let's call it tcomp, and then it sends it back to the reader, and in total, the, the whole round trip time will be measurable by the reader by, because he has set uh, a timer, and he is checking the timer after receiving of the response. Then the reader will, after finishing the protocol, he will accept the tag as being close enough if this delta t is smaller than a certain threshold. And let's see how we can calculate the threshold. There's a very simple law, and that's the law that uh, information cannot travel faster than light. So if you say c is the speed of light, then c times the pure time that the message we're traveling, so that's delta t minus the computation time of the tag, and then divide it by two because it's a two-way message. This will be the uh, distance between the reader and the tag. It's a very simple formula. Unlucky is the case that we don't know the computation time of the tag, and that's one of the problems. So ideally, we want to have this computation time as small as possible in order to have a very simple approximation um, by simply discarding the t-comp. An attacker could get hold of the tag and overclock it and letting it run faster than you would expect, implying that the tag would be closer than it is in fact. So this is uh, pretty straightforward. Um, this is in fact the basis of one of the models that is, uh, has been developed a few years ago by David Basin and some colleagues to uh, prove that certain protocols are satisfying uh, that, 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 that there are no distance bounding attacks on them. Um, the model itself is the starting point for our research, and it, of course it's a few pages of dense math, but I will try to summarize it in one slide. So the model has time traces, where we have events, E, and timestamps, T, and there are two more features that you need to know in the model. One is that it considers the distance between two agents, A and B. Rather than having the location of the two agents, it considers the distance as a primitive notion. And then finally, we have the notion of claim events, a special type of events, apart from the reception and the sending of messages. These claim events, uh, they state at the end of the behavior of, the, say, the reader, it states that the reader has checked two things. One, the authentication is correct, so the, the response was indeed related to the challenge. And second, it was fast enough to be within this distance D that you expect. So that's the two things that are stated in a claim. And formally it states party A has reached its end of the protocol and it concludes that party B is close enough to him based on the observation of sending the challenge, which is event A, and receiving the response, which is event B. So that's, the, uh, that's all you need to know of this model in order to appreciate the, the formal definition that they gave. Of course, I simplified everything as much as possible. And the model of Bayesian et al. 
they, uh, they have the following approach to defining secure distance bounding. So a protocol P satisfies secure distance bounding if for every trace generated by the protocol, if that trace contains a claim event, so if it contains a successful execution of the protocol by the reader, then there are instances of these two events, small a and b, and an instance is simply assigning a time, uh, time point to it. So there are time points t a and t b such that the distance between H in capital A and ca capital B satisfies this distance relation that I just explained. So this is basically the definition of secure distance bounding. They implemented in Isabel Hall and with a bit of effort, they could verify protocols. This is the end of the known things. And so next I make the transition to what we added to this knowledge. And the first observation is that this distance between A and B, which should be smaller than half C times the time difference, this is very symbolic. None of the protocols uses absolute time. They are also use, always use this kind of symbolic time. And the observation that I made is that this symbolic thing leads to a, a step further in abstraction away of timing, namely replace timing by causality. And causality means the order of the events in your trace. And I'll try to explain the, the intuition that I have to, to be, uh, behind the result. So we have a, a distance bounding protocol and we have an execution, which is a correct ex execution, in which a challenge arrives at B and after that the response is made up. So this is a standard uh, execution that you would expect. Now suppose we have a flaw in this protocol then an attacker would be able to produce this kind of behavior. It could preempt the reception of the challenge and send the response that you would expect before it even receives the challenge. And in this way, if he can predict the challenge, uh, he can predict the response correctly, he pushes the delta t in a way such that the distance is smaller than it in fact is. So this is what I would call early timing. And what you see is there is a violation of the causality what, what, that we expect. There's a violation of the causality at the site of B that uh, response is being created after the challenge has been uh, received. We could even push this a bit further, namely, once you know that you can produce your, ch your response be without knowing the challenge, you could even send the response before the challenge has been sent itself. There's no reason to wait for the challenge to be sent. So this is in fact what we call very early timing. And now the idea is that in the third diagram, you see that there is between the sending of the challenge at the A side and the reception of the response, there is no activity of B at all in between these events. And that's the crucial part of dealing with causality in distance bounding protocols. And we have the very simple claim that if there's a protocol with a flaw that allows for an early timing flaw, then it should also allow for a very early timing flaw. And that's in fact the, the intuition behind the whole proof of our uh, methodology. And this also gives us an alternative definition of distance bounding security, which we call causality-based uh, distance bounding. And it states that if we look at all untimed traces that contain some claim at the end of the reader roll, then we have three indexes of this trace. The first index, I, relates to the sending of the challenge. The third index, K, relates to the reception of the response. And we see that sending should be for reception, but we also see this index J, which relates to any event of the tag in between I and J. So we only have to require that for every uh, claim, there are instances of A and B, and there must be in between this instance of A and B, there must be any activity from the tag itself. 
So that's the formulation that we made. Uh, we were able to formulate it as a formal theorem, and the proof is uh, not too complicated. Uh, in fact, we cut the proof in two parts. Um, we formulated seven properties that are relatively obvious in the model of, of Basin and which are sufficient for us to prove our theorem. So this is uh, the, the step towards the, the proof. Of course, you can read it all in the paper. Um, implementation in Tamarin was pretty straightforward, except for the fact that we had to do quite a lot of abstraction of the protocols itself. We looked at a set of protocols from literature most of the protocols with errors, we confirmed that these errors were there automatically by uh, push button technology. Protocols that were correct, we confirmed that they co were correct in our model as well, but we found two protocols, the threat and the face safe model protocol that for which we found new, model, new attacks just by pushing uh, the, the Tamarin uh, engine. To finalize, so what we have achieved, we have formulated a variation of an existing uh, property by using only causality, which allowed for fully autom automatic verification of distance bounding protocols. Um, we provided uh, verification of a set of, of uh, existing protocols and we found attacks in uh, protocols pay safe and threat. And in fact, the threat protocol was proven correct by the authors in a different formalism. And we try to understand why their proof is invalid, and that's because they have a weaker attacker model than what is normal in this field. Okay, thank you for your attention. I'm happy to answer any questions. So for questions, please state your name and affiliation uh, before asking the question. Uh, so I was wondering if your definition sound with respect to the definition of uh, sound and complete with respect to the definition of Bayesian or just sound? It's equivalent to the definition, so it's sound and complete for the class of what they call well-formed protocols. For, 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 you, for the class, huh? for the class, what uh, what is called well-formed protocols, and uh, David Bayesian considers only sound protoc uh, sane protocols, which he calls well-formed protocols. And so do you have an example of a protocol that is not within this class? Yeah, for example, a protocol that has a trace that goes back in time. So you do something and suddenly there's an event at an earlier time point. That is not a sound protocol. Okay. Yeah, so th these are quite, re I, I checked them, these are quite reasonable uh, expectations. Uh, Thank you. Thanks. So maybe also a quick question uh, for me. Uh, you mentioned that there were two protocols where you found flaws. Yeah. Uh, how unexpected were these? Was it exactly the same flaw, or can you give us a little bit more um, details about that? They, they were quite unexpected. Um, so the, the, the space safe protocol is based on, I think it's EMV. It's just an extension with uh, distance bounding, if I'm correct. So I didn't expect they, them to make errors in that. And uh, the threat protocol, they proved it correct. And uh, they used an uh, existing proof method, but that method was incomplete. That was clearly, clearly the case. So that was quite unexpected to find errors in proven protocols. So maybe we, we oh. can, oh, no, no. we have, oh, yes, yeah, oh, sorry. Hi, <laughs> this is uh, Robert Lichoff from MIT Wakefield Lab. Uh, thank you for an interesting presentation. So I'm not very familiar with the field, but um, are these protocols often relying on some cryptographic primitives to achieve causality? Uh, yeah, the early protocols uh, by, by David Sham uh, 25 years ago, they, they, they were based on cryptographic primitives. Nowadays, we, we look very much at, uh, at solutions for RFID technology. And as you know, crypto is not easy to integrate with RFID technology, so they often have exclusive or and simple hash uh -huh. functions. And, and was that the source of some of the protocols they didn't? No, 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 no. Oh, I see. So there were other reasons. They, they were logical flaws, not uh, not of the cryptographic type. Absolutely not. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Hi. 
Hi, my name is Juana from University of Surrey. Uh, thank you for the presentation, Shauke. So, um, in in your work, which is very nice, by the way, you have this uh, crux lemma that says that uh, an early send would imply a very early send from the tag side, and I think that that's perfectly valid in your model. But just an observation that in practice, tags these days receive things bit by bit, and because they receive things bit by bit. Um, bit by bit, then this would not necessarily be the case. So I can, you send me a nonce, as I see the first bit arriving, I send you back the first bit, I receive the second bit, I send you back the, f the second bit, and so on and so forth. So maybe this is some scope for thinking about how if somehow say uh, in your terms you would be modeling bits, then you'd have, you'd need a different sort of causality yeah, so to, to go to, to model this type of attacks. Yeah. Where in fact, I can process the messages as I go along, and therefore an early, an early send does not imply a very early send. Yeah, I, I, I fully agree with your observation. We have uh, two approaches here. One is uh, the approach that um, is if the, the challenges are sequenced in a sense, as you have uh, explained, then we should have a claim for each challenge response cycle per bit. And in, in that sense, it, it may work out with this approach. And the second is that we are hard working on um, uh, translating our results to a more probabilistic model where we can do statistical analysis. We, we have some initial ideas, and it will take um, at least a few months to, to come with something useful. So. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you for the question. Right. Let's, let's thank our speaker.